do that? No, I don't do that. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me ever up there? Yeah? Okay, good. Welcome to the CIA Copia and the Culinary Institute of America's California campus. Um, Copia is the second property that the CIA now runs within the Napa Valley. Our first, if you're familiar with it, if not, is Greystone, which is up in St. Helena. And that is where we teach our uh, associate degree programs to our culinary art and baking and pastry students. So I wanted to take a minute just to give a brief plug for the CIA, if I might. Uh, my name is Tom Bensel. I'm the managing director. So the CIA is a nonprofit private college best known for educating some of the top chefs in the world. And we also have four campuses. Um, out here in California is uh, the second campus that we have, but our main campus is in Hyde Park, New York. Uh, we also have a campus in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, just a few years ago opened a campus in Singapore. So we're truly reaching out to the world of the culinary arts and beyond. Um, what you may not know is that we are so much more than that. We not only offer degrees in culinary arts and baking and pastry arts, but also bachelor degrees in hospitality management, food science, and a graduate level program in wine and beverage. Some of our students actually are here tonight. Uh, they came down from Greystone. They'll always let you know. <laughs> Another aspect of the CIA is our consulting division that works with food manufacturers and restaurant hospitality companies throughout the world. In addition to that, we have been the thought leader in engagement with the industry through our strategic initiatives group, which holds 12 major conferences here in California every year with partners like the Harvard School of Public Health, MIT Media Lab, UC Davis, and Stanford. They cover some of the most important topics of the day for our industry, health and wellness, nutrition science, volume food service, menu research and development, and collaboration between agriculture and food service. What we have also done on a much smaller scale has been to engage with most of you this e that are here this evening, the public, the consumer, the enthusiast, um, those who desire to know more about the food they eat, the beverages they drink, where it comes from and why it tastes the way it does. Is it healthy? And so much more. We want to build on that connection with all of you. So here we are at Copia. This is what Copia is. CIA Copia is the public face of the Culinary Institute of America. It's a place where we will work with our industry partners, but even more importantly, a place we will engage with the community and those visiting the Napa Valley and the Bay Area. Our programming and experiences cover a wide range of topics and skills. With interactive classes and our new state-of-the-art uh, kitchens, almost, February 16th, <laughs> cooking demonstrations, ongoing now, food, wine, and beverage festivals, community concerts and plays, a culinary arts museum, our restaurant, retail store, and programming like this evening's conversations at Copia, which we do with our good friends at the um, lexicon of sustainability, which we, we truly are so proud to be a partner with, and they truly help us out, and it's a, it's a great partnership. And I think that there's a few things that have popped up about the future um, programs that are gonna be happening here. Um, and we thank uh, Laura and Douglas uh, Gayton, who are, are, are partners in this, for helping us put this all together. This is an example of what they do. Um, this program, like I said, will be featured every month, the first week of the month. Some of the topics that were up there, culinary innovation, terroir, sustainable seafood, and more. So we want to start the evening with a screening of a short film, The Soil Story. And then we'll be right back. If you're like most people, you're probably feeling a little hopeless about climate change and the damage we've done to our planet. Well now, there's a new way to look at climate change and how to deal with it that might just turn that hopelessness into hope. Climate change, as we know, is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere. But carbon is not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it, even us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants first appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance between these pools, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, that would be us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool, which was pretty much a timeout zone for carbon. 
We've been burning it for energy, putting into play, and disrupting that balance. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. The oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, throwing off the ocean's balance, resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know it, of course we need to stop burning fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get the cycle back in balance? The good news is that the answer is literally right under our feet. It's the soil. Plants, using sunlight and water, naturally perform photosynthesis. They pull carbon in from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of these sugars down through the roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build healthy soil. Voila, carbon moved. The plants pump it in and the soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost can help regenerate healthy soil, setting up an ongoing feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. Together with other regenerative practices, like not tilling the soil, planting trees and cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain billions of tons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient rich and full of life and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone who eats. Remember this, the way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into our atmosphere or pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of our soils, and the health of our planet are one and the same. So a, a quick thank you. Earlier today we featured a chef and a farmer. Anthony Mint of the Perennial and Farmer Tucker Taylor from Jackson Family Wines. We want to thank them very much for coming here and putting on two demonstrations here in the theater that were, were truly inspirational. And with that, I'd, I'd like to continue that topic and, um, and, and basically introduce our guests this evening. We're extremely honored uh, to present our panelists, Alice Waters and Bob Kennard. And moderating for this evening is Brock Dolman. Brock is an ecologist and bold hydrology visionary, and as the director of the Water Institute and the Occidentals Ecology Center and Permaculture Design Program. So we're very proud to have Brock here to moderate this evening's program. Thank you. Thank you all. How you feeling, people? Yeah. Look at all you guys. Hi. Well, I am so happy to be here with you all, and I'm so happy to be here with Alice and Bob tonight. And I do want to give a big shout out to everybody at CIA and CIA Copia and Lexicon of Sustainability. Aren't those information artworks out there so fun that Douglas and Laura do? Really fun. So. Uh, the intention of tonight really is um, to allow a couple of old friends to drop into conversation about some history, the current um, reality around food and agriculture, and, and then I think uh, leveraging off of the film you just saw a little bit about some thoughts about the future and, and the relationship about how in many respects so much of the, the work that's been being done in, uh, with Bob's work in, on the farm and, and then the connection obviously with Alice's work and Shea Panisse there supporting that is 40 years ahead of its time and, and, and we're going to keep that going. Um, I had a couple thoughts here. I was just, um, I think many of you all know Alice Waters um, and her books are out there and she'll be signing afterwards. But I, I was reviewing the bio there and 
Wow, she has so many. You have been getting so many wonderful honors lately. A couple things I wanted to note is that she did found in 1995 the Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley and that whole process. <clears throat> and, and just to note that the proceeds from all of your contributions tonight um, are, are going to be given to the Edible Schoolyard as a donation to support that program. <clears throat> Uh, OAC's had an edible uh, school garden teacher training program for that entire time in 95, and we worked with the edible schoolyard for many years and trained folks. It's, it's one of the best things out there for sure. Um, and then I was just reading that um, so she's been the vice president of Slow Food International since 2002 and then conceived and helped the Yale Sustainable Food Project that, leads it, um, in, that led to the Rome Sustainable Food Project and the American Academy in Rome in 2007. And then I like this kind of stuff here that... Um, she's also uh, um, has been elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Harvard Medical School's Global Environmental Citizen Award, which she shared with Kofi Annan in 2008. All right. <clears throat> then in 2010, she gets inducted into the French Legion of Honor. <clears throat> and in 2015, she's awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Obama. <clears throat> You know, it's, I, so the sense about how really proving that eating is a political act and, and participating in that and, and, and such. And so I know um, we may, she may talk a little bit more about it, her current book, but um, she has been the author of another 15 other books. And the memoir is going to be really interesting because it's, it's a tale of a 40-year of a love story with you and the land and people. Well, it's not quite a 40-year one because I stopped the story at the opening of Chez Penny's. Oh. <laughs> and uh, it's from birth to that point. And it was very purposeful because I wanted very much to talk about how I came to do that thing that I did when I was 27 in Berkeley, and I, I wanted to talk about really the empowerment that I've felt. I never questioned whether I should do it or that I was a woman and that was unusual. Or I never, ever thought about it because it was that free speech movement and those values that I... I held close, and I just said, I can do this, and if it's good, then people will come. And that's what happened, you know? Wow. <clears throat> and come they have, and eaten they have, and <laughs> digested it. I want to bring Bob into the conversation here, and just a quick introduction on Bob Kennard. Some of you all may know him as the plant doctor. And <clears throat> he's been... Uh, you know, an, an expert organic farmer, and, and I think specifically not just organic, but really a natural process farmer, which is, is different than maybe organic. People think about certified organic, per se, really about. And then I think it's often um, known, or Alice is one of your, your first official farmers, if you will, back in the day. And, and certainly, Bob, having grown up in the nursery business and worked on the land almost his entire life as well, um, has been then cavorting with Alice in, in the garden there and the farm and the food and, and, and just conspiring to, you know, create this convivial container of cuisine that has changed the world and, and doing it with such passion. And then really more recently, I know Bob's been um, with his partner and, and winemaker friend Fred Klein created the Green String Institute and have been teaching natural process agriculture to um, uh, young folks of all ages for quite a long time and continues to do that today. And we were sampling some of the wine out there, I believe, tonight that actually comes from grapes that are part of that project. So uh, please also give a nice big welcome here to Bob Kennard. <laughs> what do you think, Bob? Well, that was kind of a... I do grow food, but mostly grow soil. No. The, the 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 growth of the soil is is um that that that's that's you know you look at you look at at humanity's quest for understanding and we we're always looking outward and and we have you know we have the 
Einsteinian theories of, of mass and energy and, and um, you know, and it's, a, and it's expansive. But in soil, we've got the cosmic energies coming into the earth and, and the mass, the mass of the soil is, is the life of the soil and the myriad of organisms that work in cohort in a, in a civilized fashion and, and, and the more you have, the more you can have. And within the structure of undisturbed nature, even agricultural nature in a thoroughly evolved garden soil, the, the energy is what's squared, not the speed of light. And the energy is what brings the fullness, the flavors, the, the actual physical completeness to that which Alice gets to put on the table. I'm very, very lucky. You know, when I met Bob, and it's almost been, it has been 30 years? Something like that. Something like that. And, I mean, just the story about it, I think, is very interesting because my father uh, saw that we were struggling always to find the right tasty food for the restaurant. And he said, I'm going to go out there and see who's growing food and make a farm to restaurant connection for you. So you really will have a farm of your own. And he spent, well, half a year going around to all of the farmers. He went to Davis first and said, I want a list of all the organic farmers within one hour of Chez Panisse. And then he and my mother went, went all over Northern California and visited the farms. He came and he told us that, that there were two people that he thought could be good, but one of them was just right for us, just crazy enough for Chez Panisse, <laughs> he said. And he was a kind of neat as a pin kind of person. But when, and he, he believed, I mean, he was an agricultural engineer. He always had a victory garden. He always planted everything in little rows and probably put pesticides on them in the 50s. <laughs> but he came upon Bob, and uh, he looked out there, and he couldn't see any of the vegetables. And Bob said, hey, come with me. He took him out there pulled aside the weeds and picked up these beautiful, beautiful carrots and, uh, and just opened my father's eyes to a whole other way of thinking about farming. I mean, I'm sure you remember that day. How can I not <laughs> remember Pat Water? And, and when I went up there, uh, he said, you have to taste this carrot. My carrot is 10 times more nutritious than anybody else's carrots. And I said, how can you say that, Bob? He says, because it's true. <laughs> and I, it took me, really, I always thought, this is a joke, this is a joke. And then I found out that it is true that they were actually analyzed and that we get to use this incredible food at Chez Panisse and that it's not only alive because it's just been picked that day, <laughs> but it has this goodness that comes through the skin of the carrot from all of the, 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 the the worms. Interactive God. surface of yeah. nature. <laughs> How do you talk about that? And I'm just like, uh, you know, I, I feel so incredibly lucky that... Well, the garden's lucky and the people that get it, uh, if you can get it, no, that's where health comes from. Physical completeness. Physical completeness in balance. Like, you have, you have good digestion and you're healthy. Your soil has 
good digestion and your plants are healthy, you know, plants, plants will get bugs. We call them pests. I don't believe there's anything that we should call pest. That this is a staging of adversity within the structure of the garden. The, the, the pest is an, an example of, of disorder, of physical incompleteness. Everything out there has a complete immunological system. And if the soil is truly alive, a civilized, interactive culture where one organism's activities benefit a myriad of other activities, then in the plant, as in that little flick we were seeing, the plants do, they gather in sunlight energy and utilize the minerals they didn't talk about, very important as the catalysts, and bring in the the components of the atmosphere to make sugars and they pump those sugars into the soil and feed that soil biology and grow grow soil biology that lives and dies and absorbs and dissolves the acidulates the the mineral elements within the structure of the soil and brings it to the plant physical completeness so we feed our gardens soil biology indigenous soil biology and and we use uh, raw igneous rocks. You know how always these great um, volcanic areas, especially in the Asian region of our of our uh, planet, where, where we have a, a, a volcano and all the best gardens are there and whatnot, and then it's going to blow off and everybody has to leave and they come right back because that's where the best food grows. Wow, virgin, fresh volcanic cinders and ash, beautiful, beautiful, quickly cooled, paramagnetic. It twinkled stardust for Earth. The, 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 the electron surface area isn't bonded up tight to silica or anything else. Things like to be like to like, and they don't have a chance when they're quickly cooled, and that kind of vitality associated with the, the, the digestive force of physical completeness. It brings that carrot to actually have physical completeness and taste better and be better for you. It doesn't matter whether it's a carrot or whether it's a broccoli. You grow a plant by truly loving it rather than forcing it to grow. You think of it not as something that, that you have any control of. You look at it as if it were your child. You look at it, you want to bring everything to it. You give it a life of choice, just like you guys all had a life of choice to come here. You grow your garden with a life of choice. You pay attention. You look at its physical characteristics and allow it to bloom. If you see weakness, pay attention and overcome weakness. Bring that food to somebody that can prepare it and put it forth so that it actually can touch the consciousness of those of us lucky enough to get some of it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen somebody emulate a volcano? I mean, you're, you're going to espouse volcanic eruption. You need to be that. Oh, very important. Oh, you remember when the one blew off over in Iceland, I think, uh, and the ash covered the northern hemisphere and the airplanes couldn't fly in Europe? And, and um, uh, oh, what a blessing. Absolutely a blessing. Re natural remineralization of the northern hemispheres. I remember, I just as a little story aside, uh, one time I took uh, this costume designer, Eiko Ishioka, she did the costumes for Francis Coppola's film Dracula, and she was wearing a, a white dress to visit Bob Kennard and see his farm. <laughs> and, he took her uh, out there in the field. She really wanted to know what it was all about. And they are out, and I'm watching them out there in the field. And all of a sudden, Bob's picking up some of the soil, and she is eating it. <laughs> she is eating it. It's just he was having that particular discussion with her, and she ate, ate that. 
Well, you know, all of our antibiotics and all of our nature contacts is, comes directly from the, from the well-balanced and nourished earth. And, and that's uh, one of the reasons we have so many disorders within our own health um, environment, because we've separated ourselves a little too far away from nature. Well, I would think it, mm -hmm. right? it, if folks have spent any time, say, in, in conventional agricultural fields in the Central Valley or the Salinas Valley, where the worldview of that process of agriculture sees this force of life that Bob is describing here as simply nothing but a dead abiotic substrate that you're going to plow until you get to the mineral fraction and you pulverize it all into its basic texture of sands and silts and clays and then you make sure it's dead with methyl bromide just to make darn sure it's dead. So we have literally an antibiotic right, against life process. There's antibiotic and uncobiotic. Those are folks at Thanksgiving. Right? <laughs> so what is what Bob's describing I think is it, and the life force, the force of life that was in that carrot only comes from living soil, not dead dirt. And the probiotics or antibiotics is a is an agricultural uh, opportunity for a trajectory in either direction. And I think what we've been witnessing in the conversation and, and your all's collaboration over the decades is a deep commitment to probiotics, to being about in harmony and collaboration with several billion years of intelligence of evolved life forms that figured out how to get along with each other and create conditions conducive for collaboration and then once again cuisine that we so love. So I'm interested in, I know Alice you talk a lot about how the, there's, there's fresh ingredients but at some point it's what where they're, where they're grown to thrive and, and then what you do with that to nourish the soul and, and nourish, um, in Bob's case, the soil. The soul soil, soul soil <laughs> combo is the, the, the edge I'm interested in you two exploring because I feel like you've got nourished souls while you nourish soils. Well, Bob always said that, um, you know, it's a little, it's like bringing up a child um, that, that, if you want that child to thrive and to be all it can be, you, you, you really want to create, have the soil doing that for the carrot. And it can have the, all the taste that it's possible to have. It can be something really, really special. And I guess what we try to do is, is just not get in the way of of getting that taste to the table. And it's very, very important to us to, to allow the fruits and vegetables to, to taste of what they are. And um, I, I think that uh, uh, Bob also said, you know, what he does for us is create like a vegetable garden in the backyard for a family. He's not growing big, huge patches of, of, of one thing or another. He's growing a lot of different things that we can use. And at first, I would say to him, here are the seeds that I want planted. And he'd look at me. And, and I said, please, I want the radicchio, the seed I got from Italy, and I want that, and I want this planted. And now he tells us what to cook. <laughs> He's bringing us nettles. Now, this happened about six years ago, and we figured out how to create a pizza with nettles and pecorino cheese and garlic. And it is the most popular pizza at the restaurant. I mean, it's amazing. We're buying his weeds. <laughs> it's hard to believe. <laughs> he figured out how to meddle with his nettle. <laughs> no such thing as a weed. That's right. There's no such thing as a weed. It's true. No, every, every plant, every everything. You know, there are, the simplicity is 
All we have to do is recognize the simplicity and give up our kind of ego. What science, agricultural science does is we look out at it as, as, as researchers and, and we see that plants need certain elements and we say they're macro and micro and, and you need this and you need that and so on and so forth. And, and we don't even know what we need ourselves. How can we possibly know what an organism of a different order of life needs to come into being? And so just like recognize the simplicity of the structure of nature and allow it to transpire at plants. All life is made out of four primary food groups, and one of those food groups are compounds that come out of the air, the hydrogen and the carbon and the oxygen. And another of those food groups is the, is the digestive force of biology, the contact, like, like we eat, but what we're doing is feeding our internal biology, and the plant's biology is there, that's the soil. And, and that's biology is situates and digests the minerals, the full spectrum minerals, and it's all fueled by the cosmic energies of, we call it sunlight, but all the cosmic energies. And just allow it to happen. You know, a light hand in the structure of nature. You, we saw the little film, and why? Of course we have to sequester carbon in the soil. Why we have global, warming, climate change, however you wish to, why do we not go out and, and invest, invest activity of, of storing carbon in the hot spots of our planet, which are man-made deserts, the Sahara, the Gobi, especially our own Southwest, all the Baja California, not so long ago was a rainforest. Now, we just need to turn those places green again and bring that carbonaceous material back in, stimulate life. No, and it starts right there in your own little plot. It is an extremely easy thing to do. Work with a little less ego, a little lighter hand. Let it work. Just let nature work. And gain health yourself while you're at it. What Bob's talking about, we call ego system restoration. We have to restory the ego system with a new storyline about that we're a part of, not apart from, to get back to the restoration of the ecosystem. But we should enjoy ourselves along the way. Regenerative hedonism through good food, right? Why not? <laughs> what do you think, Allison? <laughs> what do I think? What do I think? I think you know what I think. <laughs> No, but I, I, I do think that taste is what's going to bring us back to our t senses. It's what brought me to mind when I went to France when I was 19 and I tasted a fraise de bois. I wanted another one. And I wanted to know what they were, where they were grown, I wanted to plant them as soon as I got back to California. Where do you get that taste? I felt that way about a baguette. I felt that way about an oyster. And I was looking for taste. And I ended up at the doorsteps of Bob Kennard and many other wonderful farmers in Northern California and ranchers, and it was about taste. And we are completely focused on that at Chupanese. It is uh, just an ongoing search. How can we capture that? How can we offer it to people? And it's so that they, you know, wake up and they do, you know, people come into the restaurant now and they say, when are Bob's chicories going to be here? When, uh, you know, they learn the name. When is Mas Masamoto's peach coming? Suncrest peach, where is it? You know, at the mulberries. I, I mean, I think it, it's easiest with fruit. And right now it's the moment of of the uh, Kishu mandarins that come from Ojai. And I, I have this thing that I call uh, Kishu diplomacy, 
where I take two boxes of these back for a benefit I'm doing in Washington, D.C. at the end of the month. And I take them and I send them to people who I want to influence. <laughs> and they all fall for it. They all write me back and say, that's the best thing I've ever tasted, a little seedless kishu. And we have them, we just do that fruit bowl at the restaurant, and people can't get over the taste of that particular citrus. And it's so gratifying for me to sort of win people over that way. And that's the basis for the Edible Schoolyard Project with the kids. I wasn't ever trying to tell them this is what to eat or don't eat that. It's just to engage them. And they find it. They find it themselves. And it's so exciting to see that happen. And once they find it, they never forget that. And so when they're doing their math class out there in the garden, they're eating those, <laughs> those raspberries in, in the spring. And they go there first. They know where, to, where it is, and they know which ones are ripe. And it's just nature. They're falling in love with nature. Just exactly what Bob said. I mean, really falling in love. And once you get that, you have it forever. So we just need to begin it in kindergarten. And uh, I don't know, should we talk about my big plan? <laughs> you guys want to hear about the big plan? The big, the big plan. plan? Well, I'm calling it school-supported agriculture. Okay? So, we decide to feed every student a free, sustainable school lunch. We begin there. Every kid in the state of California. I mean, I want the whole country. But we'll begin in California. Okay. And... What we want to do is we want it to become part of academia because if we don't have the time and attention, kids just eat it, uh, some eat it and some don't, and the kids who need it the most don't. And it's a kind of fast food nation, free for all in the cafeteria. So we want them to sit down. And so the way that we're connecting it is like this. We're taking a class that they may have of, you can hold these stuff up, I love that. Um, they're studying geography in the Arabian Peninsula, okay? And they're learning about what grows in different places of what sea level and up in the mountains. And for lunch, they're going to have the food from the Middle East. They're going to have a tabbouleh salad. They're going to have some hummus. They're probably going to have a little spicy carrot soup. And so, and the pita bread, of course. And they're going to get credit for eating it. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> but... This is a big initiative to support the people who are taking care of the land and all the people who help on the farm. So it will be an initiative for the farm workers with a fair wage, the farms that are doing it, learning from Bob, and that and the ranches. And we're going to to really skip the middleman and do what we've done for so many years at Chez Panisse, buy directly from the farmers and the ranchers all over California. So it's a way to bring a, a local economy to life 
that the schools where 20% of our kids, 20% of the population in this country is in school. Let's say the University of California sort of kicked it off, completely buying all of the food from people who are doing the right thing. It could be amazing. Change agriculture overnight. So get ready, all you farmers. <laughs> get ready. We're going to do this. Bob, you think we need to train some farmers to, for this effort? You got some thoughts on that? Small, diverse, and local. Very, very important. That's what it's all about. Individuals, community, people. You know, we got out in our culture, we have, we have um, all sorts of different professions. We've got doctors that are present to take care of our ills, which are the vast majority of them associated with nutritional shortfall. And, and, and then we have a lot of legal professionals that are out there to take care of our mental disorders of antagonism. And you know, if we really ate good and good food, when we could, you know, the farmer would become just as an important participant. And perhaps we wouldn't need as many doctors and as many legal professionals. <laughs> no? here, here. So, so let's, uh, let's embrace this concept and, and get the community. This is what the Green String Institute has been, bit, been about, trying to teach you know, mostly college graduate kids, that it's really simple and practical and a meaningful way to spend your life growing food and becoming a member, a participating member of your community. It's um, a wonderful, no better place to raise a child than within the structure of nature, within the structure of a garden. So why not? Why not spend some of that time doing those kinds of things? Feeding your indigenous peoples while raising and feeding your whole, your whole life. I, just, I don't know. I, that's, that how, that's what uh, I, I see happening. That's how I've spent my life. And I'm, I'm absolutely, um, I've been blessed to be able to, to find degraded soils that I can resuscitate. One of the best things to, is to take something that's been, that's been injured and heal it. And um, uh, I need those blessings in my, in my life. Well, I think you're right. The work of, of rebuilding soils um, based on what you saw in the film there of carbon farming, regenerative agriculture is truly is healing work. It's, it's as uh, integrated holistic medicine for the landscape, for watersheds, for rivers, for the ocean, for the air. For all of life as, as is the medical field for ourselves and so maybe we have a kindergarten a, a new garden that's a kinder garden a kinder garden for the kindergarten <laughs> there's a wonderful movie out there that uh, about uh, Cuba and what Cuba how Cuba survived peak oil when the Russians left and Cuba had to hunker down because all the the fossil fools of the oligarchy stopped flowing their way and, and all those doctors and lawyers, they all became farmers. Everybody started becoming a farmer and they started worm farms and growing food and urban agriculture. And when things get real, people get real. And so training them up from the very beginning and, and giving them the taste. I, I appreciate your, I want to hear more about just the taste of reality so they have a, a real taste on the tongue. Well, the farmers also need support Absolutely. Somebody that they can count on. It's very chancy to sell all of your food in a farmer's market situation. You don't know who's coming, who's going to buy it. But just imagine if the schools would buy it, buy all of it, and directly from you. I mean, this is a, a, a real support system for young people who want to go into farming. I know what a struggle a lot of people have. And I think restaurants need to adopt farms in this way as well. Just say, I'm, I'm taking everything you have, you know? And that's the way it is. And what you learn from that is really amazing. Really, really amazing.
the values that come to us. Now, we, we send all our compost back to Bob. Of course, he looks through and it says, what is this fork doing in here? And why didn't you, why didn't you use all the ends of the chart? And why are you throwing away that? Uh, yeah, but, <laughs> but it's really important. We have somebody who takes all of that those scraps from the vegetables, takes that back to the farm and then brings us the vegetables. I mean, it's an amazing closed system. We hardly have anything that's picked up by, you know, the garbage man. It's all going back and being used. So that feels so right to do it that way. And then he can cock something out of it. Tell them about your compass. No, it is totally, it's not a pipe dream. This is totally doable. You know, if you, here, here, I, uh, we're in the greater Bay Area, but I live in, in work in Sonoma County, and we have approximately 500,000 people there. And, and if, if it's a community activity, if we all spent $2 a day, you know, we'd have a million bucks a day in gross cash flow that would support a whole number of thousands of small local farming activities, place of employment for people, place of education for the children, opportunity, a stable cash flow that, that, that we're already spending. You know, we spend, I don't know, three or four billion dollars a year in Sonoma County on foods that we import through the conventional channels. And we have in this region of California the capacity to grow absolutely everything. You know, I don't grow true arctic things like blueberries, and I don't grow true tropical things like bananas, but I grow avocados and I grow those mandarins and uh, everything in between. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds of different crops. So it, we, as a true element of it, it, the farmer can't just do it all, the educators can't just do it all. We need, we need a sense of commitment from the, all of us as per really participating in you're developing some sense of community you know you there you you go and you get your csa box or you go to the farmer's market or you go to this restaurant that that you know has relationships with these local producers and 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 you you get foods that are as absolutely as seasonal and as fresh as possible that you mentioned the chicories why those sweet bitter chicories in the middle of the winter time oh a delight to the eye as well as the palate and bringing organic molecular structure to your, to your cellular base that's going to sustain you from from the uh, the from the, the flu virus you know instead of getting infected inoculated with the flu virus eat your chicories <laughs> don't stop with the chicories those leeks and other brassicas are their soul, nature has produced a plethora of tastes out there. And, and I'm a farmer. I don't know how to put them together, you know. I have farm food, you know, but it's all good stuff. And uh, it maintains consciousness as well as health. <laughs> yes. I think one, one point when... The, the recycling of the quote waste, the idea that in nature waste equals food and there is no waste, it's input for other cycles. And how can we become ecologically literate enough to see one perceived waste as the input for a compost pile with worms to feed the carbon back to the plants? And for those who are tracking the reality of, of food waste in America right now and the amount of food that's wasted, some of which never gets to the table or gets to the table, and then when it goes in the bin and then it either ends up in the landfill to anaerobically digest to make methane or it's, it's causing problems. And so in the film when you noticed there was a, they said, and science, there was a science uh, study recently done that showed that a certain amount of compost uh, continues to allow the soil to sequester carbon. So that work is done in Marin County by the Marin uh, Carbon Project, John Wick and others there with doc, uh, Dr. Wendy Silver at Berkeley. And what John and those folks in the Marine Carbon Project are finding is the soils want the compost and life knows what to do with it and we want the nutrients and the minerals. We don't have enough compost to do what we need to do to both sequester all the CO2 in the atmosphere, hold the water, and support mineral uh, nutrient-dense foods. And so 
if anything, in your one thing you get to do is we is recycle your green waste, compost your own green waste, collect it and make sure it's getting composted so that we can grow real food with it. It's really important, I think, that the compost thing happens because it's that's kind of magic. It's it's the opposite end of the kitchen. Like the compost <laughs> pile is is the culinary opposite of the kitchen. It's creating a whole other cuisine, the true terroir of that carbonaceous material. I heard um, a long time ago from, is it Bill Morrison? Uh, uh, Bill Mollison, the Mollison. permaculture yeah, man? Uh, Bill yes. Mollison. Uh, and uh, uh, he gave a lecture maybe 25, 30 years ago that I listened to. And he said, just making a cubic yard of compost saves one cubic yard of, of ozone. And I just, it, it may, is that true? <laughs> or the <laughs> CO2 possibly, in the atmosphere. Possibly, uh, possibly CO2, more than that. Uh, yeah. maybe, so just the making of it, uh, I just make it in my backyard. And even though I can't get all involved in using it, I always make it. And with that in my my mind, that that with those those gases, those things that are happening in that. <laughs> yeah, and if we're so, if we're going to if we're going to survive on this planet, then we need to uh, we need to recognize that there is no waste. It's it's um like there's there's seven billion of us here on the planet, and and um. I, I, we're all going to live to 100 years old, but we're all going to pass. And one of these carcasses, properly composted, is is enough is enough to is enough to bring life back to one acre of near desert-like land. And and instead of using natural gas to incinerate the the, the spent flesh, um, we we make compost with this spent flesh and and. A seven, seven billion of us, a hundred years means that, that we have 70 million acres worth of compost a year. <laughs> 70 million acres of compost, 70 million acres of near desert-like land transformed back into meadow-like land. Now, we have to recognize that we have to make these kinds of changes in order to uh, really make this get this planet to be able to absorb the photonic energies that are coming in from the from the universe and 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 store it up and transform it into the fullness of energy potential of life well, well once again I, bob is can i just riff on this yeah. one for a second on this idea of of literally composting humans i just would like to let you all know <laughs> that as of Two weeks ago, the first pilot project in Washington State, they are now have a compost crematorium. And there's a wonderful TED talk by the gal who's running this show, I'm forgetting her name right now. And they've got the permits and the process and it's all good and they've set it up and instead of working the bugs out, they've worked the bugs in and they've got this vertical stack process and you get to put your loved one in a shallow place with all the mushrooms and the yes. and all of that stuff and they're composting and you get some out the bottom end and this is going to be one of the great options it's so it's happened we're two weeks into the first demo in washington state a compostorium, compostorium. And, uh, there there's an artist who did a ted talk and she designed a mushroom suit that i've already ordered it's so <coughs> beautiful that you just that's that's your burial suit and then you go. So then, like, to you the could really be a <laughs> Alice. You will really be a fun gal, and you'll be a fun guy. <clears throat> I get it. It's about mycelium and your cilium, people here, right? And so, the cool thing about mushrooms is they're like us animals. They breathe oxygen and exhale CO2. They're on the opposite side of this thing from the plants and the the little creepy crawly, um, you know, microbes and bacteria. And so that balance, the great. Uh, tr global trade agreement between oxygen and CO2, fungus and animals and plants and bacteria, one of the great trades. Huh. <laughs> Should we let do we, do we ask us some questions? Are we willing to venture in? All right, we'll do a little Q&A here and
maybe what I'll, I don't know if folks are, you stand, I'll call on you and you stand up and just ask your question loud because I'm not sure there's mics. We can give you one, but once we get up there, it's going to be hard. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I actually teach in TK, which is transitional kindergarten, which is the first year of a two-year kindergarten program. I teach in a school that's 95% free and reduced lunch in South Vallejo. I have garden boxes. How do we get my school and my schools connected with your project? Because I don't work in Berkeley. Well, uh, she's asking about how to get uh, a school district and her schools that she works in connected to the Edible Schoolyard Project. I mean, you can do it very easily, um, uh, really, online. Uh, we have a, there are 5,500 schools that are around the world uh, in every state of this country that are doing a garden program, a kitchen program, a cafeteria program. Um, so that, that's one way, but it's really important um, to connect with the powers that be, the, the superintendent of schools, the, the, the principal. Uh, there's a group in, uh, in um, Richmond, California, and Marin City that's called the Conscious Kitchen. And uh, it's really an important um, uh, organization because what they have proven is if you buy directly from the organic farmers and fishermen and ranchers, that you can fit into the budget of the USDA reimbursement. Now, fast food nation would lead us to believe that you could never buy organic food uh, uh, and have it be affordable. But when there's no middleman and you're thinking about mostly cooking vegetables and grains, you can really make it work. And in the school district, I mean, they're drinking Strauss milk out of glasses and sitting at a table and eating the real food. So we know it can happen. And it's really, uh, anybody who's got a principal that's halfway enlightened, I'm ready to come and talk the talk. One other, one other offering for you would be is that at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, since 95, we've offered a school garden teacher training program. So there are five-day residential training programs. We have two of them coming up this summer when teachers are on break. And it's not just for teachers. It's, it's as Al said, sometimes you want to get somebody on the PTA or maybe on the janitorial staff or, you, you know, parents. And so, and it's a five-day training, and there's a little bit about gardening and composting, and there's also about how to integrate the curriculum into the, uh, you know, the frameworks because you have to teach to the science framework and these different frameworks depending on grade level. And, and so there's credentialed teachers teaching about that. There's fundraising opportunities that we talk about. So it's a fully integrated five-day. We've done about every school in San Francisco has been through the program. Most of the Bay Area, we worked directly with Edible Schoolyard for years. We're a couple thousand schools in at this point nationally. So that's a very pragmatic opportunity for you as well. All right, got another hand up back there. How about we go in the middle, and, and it looks like they've got mics for you, so and then I'll come down to the front. Thank you. Um, so in the years that you've had Chez Panisse and your other restaurant ventures, um, I'm sure you know, your knowledge and, and just experiences evolved. What are you most excited about in terms of like dishes or, or food you found? And, and if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, we, you know, started out with just one menu, and we still just have one menu in the restaurant downstairs. And just having that, it pushes you to be exploring all the time, to be thinking about how dishes go together, and it's very, very important 
to us. Um, and we have interns that come and work from around the world. And I, I think that the energy that they bring in helps us to be sort of better teachers. And that's a very important part of what we're doing at, at the restaurant. Uh, but it's, it's constantly, I mean, I, I really want it to feel alive for the people who work there. And so you're, 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 you're always in a conversation about, about could this be done differently or better? It's like, uh, oh God, it's freezing that door, but it's cold. Did somebody open it <laughs> all of a sudden? I just feel the face coming in there. But it's, um, it's again, um, we're, we're opening the doors, you know, to the kitchen. And so the, the customers have the possibility uh, of seeing what's going on there in the kitchen and hearing their comments about things always helps us to get better at what we're doing. I don't know whether I answered that question right, but yeah. <laughs> fortunate enough to be part of the technology industry and work for Salesforce. Um, so we, we do a lot of giving back and I'd love to hear more about how we can help um, at Salesforce as well as other technology companies that have emulated our giving back program. In particular, I'm actually here in Napa I know a lot of people, of course, in San Francisco, but would love to hear more about how we can do not only a grassroots, but get some of our giving technology companies to help out. How divine. <laughs> Let's talk immediately. <laughs> because it's, this is, um, you know, you either pay up front or you pay out back. And we are paying up back in a way that is completely shocking. I mean, one in two kids is going to have diabetes. And we don't consider this uh, a moral obligation to feed them food that is good for them. I mean, it's, it's, it goes very, very deep, this. And what it's going to take is a collaboration on every level. I mean, we need to learn the truth about what's going on, and people need to be uh, putting that out to the world. And I just saw a film um, that uh, uh, called "Eating Animals," and I I hope that maybe it could show here at uh, at Copia because it's. Um, based on Jonathan Safra Foyer's book. But um, it's really, you know, uh, showing clearly the, the collusion between the big um, food industry and uh, how animals are raised and the government. I mean, it's just there and happening. And, and it's unbelievably shocking. But it's, it's not all the bad news in that. There's a lot of people who are really preserving the, the rare breeds and showing how, you know, turkeys can be <laughs> raised with, with love and space. And uh, so, but it's really important that we see this and we hear this and we, we get it and make every day the right choices to support the right people. And that's, that I, I think, uh, you know, in some ways the internet and allowing people to make these little films like this one that we saw tonight, if everybody sends that out, we'll learn about what regenerative agriculture is. I mean, deeply about that. And, and so it's, 
It's really a question of, of grabbing our friends and having those conversations. I mean, I know one thing for sure on, <clears throat> to support Alice's big idea about the school-supported community agriculture at, at, starting at California State is that having, been work, having worked with school districts and teachers and schools for 20 plus years now, each of those schools, they, they need, there needs to be some money there, some startup capital, some support, some infrastructure, some training support. There's lots of ways and there's some formats and I know the foundations that could help funnel that into a region or a district. Um, and what's amazing is the, what public school teachers and public schools do with a dollar, how you, you give them one buck and what they do with the bake sales and things, how far they stretch that. The ROI on, on investment in to the capacity for the school to do what it's designed to do, which is really educate the future. And then obviously the front end benefit of having the kids become educated, eco-literate consumers, eventually voters, eventually blah, 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 blah. I, it, I think that the return, the social ROI on investing in that. So I think we're both happy to talk to you about creative ways to support funneling resources to the, the big idea. Yep, here comes a mic for you. And I'm going to look in the back and I said, oh, these big lights, okay. I'm blinded by the lights. Right Thank there. you both of you for your pioneering efforts. I'm uh, very eager to see how we make a sea change and see the changes that you're discussing in nutrition for children and sustainable agriculture. There have been decades now of building this awareness and particularly in Northern California in the Bay Area, there is a sea change, but statewide, nationwide, and internationally, we have a long way to go. Um, if California can be a model, uh, I'm wondering how we get the momentum, both politically and economically and institutionally, culturally, to make that change. Um, do you have a legislator right now who's willing to carry a bill? I think we do. Yay. And if much. everybody in this room <laughs> contacts but, our but, legislators. But I think it's really important to have, the, uh, the, you know, the governor in the state of California articulate this idea. And I'm really hoping that we will have one. I believe that we will. But, you know, when Jerry Brown wanted to talk about global warming, he talked about it. He took the risk and talked about it. I mean, I just know that we have to take a stand and be willing to risk. But if it's not articulated, I, we don't have time for incremental change over 20 years. I mean, we need to turn around and plant that garden the way it needs to be planted. We need to give our money that we need to just turn and do it. And I have to say that it's a really delicious revolution. <laughs> you know, this is not hard to do. We're not asking, this is joyful for children for everybody. I remember when Kennedy said, uh, you know, we're going to have fiscal education in the public school system because we aren't fit for the new frontier. Okay, he didn't put money to it. He put cheerleading to it. He became a model himself. He got the, all the agencies in Washington to help to work out how that could happen. But we built gymnasiums, and we made physical education part of the core curriculum. What happened in World War II when we asked people to plant gardens to feed all of us so we could send food to Europe? Well, my parents had the garden for their whole lives. You know, we had thousands. They planted gardens in front of post offices and in parks and grew food, you know, and thank God that was before the pesticides came. <laughs> but it was, it's a matter of believing 
and saying, let us do this thing. We, I, I guess I'm very empowered because we stopped the war in Vietnam. And, and we helped to stop the AIDS epidemic. And we made a patchwork quilt and we put it down in the mall. I mean, we took a stand, we organized ourselves. Well, we can do this. We can do this. And we need to, and I, I really feel like California and with the politicians, many of them that we have, that, that they will take a stand and we can do this. So, get ready. Get ready. There's a hand way up in the back where it's hard to see with all the lights. That gentleman, I think, there. Thanks. Um, I'm really interested in hearing uh, an experience or two that was formative in kind of bringing you to the path where you are, uh, but formative as children. Um, kind of what experiences led you to where you are today? I uh, had a childhood injury and um, uh, fell down the stairway and, and um, up until I was about 17, every time I'd move my head around quickly, um, it, my brain would jostle around in there and, and so I uh, was a very quiet and peaceful, uh, happy to be in the garden uh, individual. Um, and, and developed a, a real close um, admiration of nature within uh, just actually looking at nature, actually looking at the plants which I grew and, and paying attention to them. You know, they have bodies, they don't run away, they don't have any deception, they don't wear dark glasses, they haven't yet learned to say I'm fine when asked. Uh, <laughs> None of this kind of stuff. Um, they have their old body parts, their past. They have their contemporary body parts, their presence. And if you learn how to pay attention, you're the one with the common senses. You can read the plant. You know there is not a single textbook in the vast libraries that I've ever encountered on plant health characteristics to really read the plant. Um, and yet, it's right there. You use all of your senses. You. You, you smell it, you taste it, you tear it and you hear it, you feel its strength, you grab it by the stem and you feel its anchorage in the soil. You know how a weed is hard to pull out because it has bonding and wants to grow there. So, no, truly pay attention. And um, yeah, at an early age I learned to pay attention. How about you, Alice? <laughs> Well, having just uh, written this memoir, uh, I looked back on my childhood really for the first time to try to think about that, how I was influenced. And I grew up before we had a television in our house. We, so we played outside and uh, we, we climbed trees and I, I was outside until my parents insisted I come in for dinner. And then, of course, my mother was a bad cook. Now, now. I know. We had good corn on the cob from the Victory <laughs> Garden and, and tomatoes in the summer, and I've always loved both of those. But, but uh, uh, it pushed me to think about taste, I think, uh, the fact that I wasn't. I was a very, very picky eater, but without any question, I, I did fall in love with nature and my mother uh, always taught me the names of all the plants and all the trees and so they were kind of friends of mine, um, especially all the New Jersey uh, plants and trees, but I, I think that helps kids uh, um, become close when you, when you learn about them and 
see the leaves and trace the leaves, which is a very sort of Montessori idea that I have incorporated into the Edible Schoolyard project, that learning by doing. And it's really the education of the senses. But I think I did too have a kind of education of the senses as a little girl. Another question up there? Am I missing a hand? All right, one right in the middle, then we'll go to that side over by the edge. Mike should be coming to you from the side. Personally, I think that the profession of a farmer is the most noble profession. I'm a farmer and a chef, and I love passionately what I do. Um, this is hard for me to get out to express, but I feel compelled to. Bob, you, you mentioned, you, know, you touched on something that, that resonated with me. The medical profession is the, uh, are people who cure sicknesses and illnesses and pains and injuries, but the farmer nurtures and nutrifies and nourishes not only the body but the soul. And I know, Alice, you've touched on that many times in the times that I've listened to you talk, where it's all about nurturing, it's all about nourishing, it's all about feeding and all about caring for the you know, people that you feed, loving them. My question is, how can we raise the consciousness of the population of this world to view the farmer as the noble person and people that they are from the state that it is right now. In this group, we all understand it. But in the general population, the farmer is treated like a poor man who's given the task to do some real very strenuous and difficult work, but when doing it out of, from the heart, produces something that feeds people that they don't need to see the doctor. They can just eat the right kind of food, like Bob said, and um, sustain health. Could you maybe extra address that? Well, I really believe we have to begin in kindergarten. We have to teach that in kindergarten. It, these are the people that feed us, our teachers and our farmers. And we've lost respect for both. And I think when, when the teachers become, um, you know, if, have a real um, pedagogy that allows them the room to, to be connected and empower children. Uh, a different way of teaching that instead of that classroom where they're all seated down, where they, they can actually learn in the garden. That, that's, that's where that respect for the farmer can, can can begin. And I think it can also, it's, a, it's both ways. I think we can lift up the farmers and the teachers together. And uh, that is my great uh, vision for the future in this state. But we, we have to come back to the table, that place of equality. Everyone needs to eat for free together. And, and when, uh, you know, when you do the work of farming, I have to say the kids that I'm close to in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, you can't believe how enthusiastic they become 
uh, they like that work. <laughs> they like to pick things. They like to dig in the gardens. They like to work the compost. And that's the beginnings of, of the respect for the people who do that work. We all need to pick beans to know how hard it is to do that. I mean, really, I, I, that's why I'm so in love with farmers, because I can't do that work myself. And I have, I just, I know what it's about. And so that's where it begins. But we got to begin when they're little, really little. Yeah, that's it. We got to have the farmer, and that's where you got to start. You know, when I went to school they, as a youngster, the uh, curriculum ridiculed the, our, our history. Oh, we used to be 90% of us uh, farmers. You know, we were subsistence farmers. Now, what's wrong with being a subsistence? What's wrong with subsistence? Um, you know, there's certainly nothing wrong with any of the professions, especially that of uh, providing sustenance, subsisting. One there. Yes, I've had, I've had a wonderful day here today. I've learned quite a bit. I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I really uh, love composting. I, I really like it. <laughs> um, and the, the only thing is uh, I, I learned so much here today. Now I'm scared. And, you know, it, it's, I, I, I guess I want to learn more. I believe in dust to dust. I believe in that the worms do the work. And now when I learn that we, we might do it for ourselves, uh, that ultimate reality of composting has, has struck me, and my train has been derailed. <laughs> so... <laughs> Basically, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more, like is the FDA approved stuff, you know? <laughs> it's like, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, my mind is spinning. So if you got any other additional information, I'd like to hear it. Well, hopefully the organizers are taking the compliment you've given them for a wonderful day. It sounds like you've had a whole day here and we're just at the end of that day. So keep spinning. You know, you know compost, for sure. We'll compost ourselves, compost the, our waste stream that, that, you know, you go into so many, like, like um, earlier we mentioned France and, and in that country, uh, very little of the waste stream material is actually composted, it's incinerated and, um, and that's, you know, uh, we had the, the, uh, the Parisian um, climate uh, thing going on over there over the last couple of years and whatnot, and so lots of consciousness. And well, why not? Why not gather that waste stream material, the organic fraction of the waste stream material, and and put it on a barge that that is like a, a slow moving compost turning generating digester and put a little tugboat on it and haul it down south and park it off the coast of the Sahara and haul that material in there and turn that, that man-made wasteland back into a meadow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Humanity has the capacity. We have been given this, this capacity to, to have, you know, the bird, every life form lives and leaves more life behind it. The bird has very few things. Its little waste stream is its bodily waste stream is its real contribution to disseminating soil biology. The duck swoofles down in the in the mud and then and then flies over and poops over on the land and dips its legs in the new clean water and carries the inoculum of the swamp to the high mountain lake and 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 the little songbird accumulates a masses on a on a sick tree and a sick tree looks shiny and the bird poops on shine. Um, you could use a different word. And, and you ever wash your car and you know what happens right away? Um, it, it is every organism that li lives and leaves more life behind it with the exception perhaps of the one organism that's 
been generated by all the other organisms to be given a true capacity of choice, here we are. Improve or degrade. Your choice. <clears throat> or as Wavy Gravy said, uh, you are what you don't defecate. I think we got time for one more question. And... All right, we'll make a final comment, and then we're wrapping it in. Um, I just want to make a comment about um, the farmers, and, and we all have opportunity to influence our children. And I'm a grandparent, and we have a meal together with our grandkids pretty regularly every week, at least two times a week, and I always cook, and I try to organic food and vegetables and stuff. And one of the things we always do when we're sitting down for a meal before and is to thank farmers and that, you know, they are the, the root of our health in every way. And the other com comment I wanted to say, I think that's we all have opportunities, the grandparents, a parent, teacher, whoever, we always thank the farmers and that's one of the way doing it. But the other thing I wanted to make comment is this program that you're starting what I really, really liked about it is it's not just for the elites, the people who could afford to have organic farming food because the cost is so high, but it's for all children at every economic level, and I really like that, and I would support it 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a, a perfect way to end with a sense of gratitude, and so... We definitely want to give a shout out to CIA and COPIA and Lexicon of Sustainability and all the organizers for an amazing day today. And certainly our wonderful Bob Kennard and Alice Waters. Give it up, people! <laughs> Alice will be signing books outside here afterwards. Olivia Rathbone from OEC will be signing cookbooks as well out there. And I think one has one got one more thing for us, Tom? Just one last thing, and, and, and thank you for bringing up the thanking of farmer. There were two people that I left out um, that, that I do need to thank. One is John Bazicki, who actually stood up and spoke to us. And John is our gardener here at Copia, and he has brought back that garden just amazingly and brought life to it. And then the person that keeps me most honest and actually spend quite a bit of time at Green Strings, our farm manager who not only works with John here at Copia, but manages our five-acre farm up in St. Helena that is graciously given to us by the Mondavi family at Krug, Matt Gunn. So thanks to both of those guys. And thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you so, so much to Alice and Bob and Brock. And we hope to see you here as much as you want to be here, but we would love to have you back. Thank you.